evening, I'll call to order the uh, workshop for the Arvada City Council for June 11th, 2018. Uh, Mr. Devin, we've got a couple of uh, workshop items tonight. Yes, we do, Mayor, uh, members of the council. We'll start the uh, presentation, uh, this workshop with a presentation from Let's Go Colorado in association with uh, a potential sales tax uh, measure for the state. Thank you. Jake, you want to introduce yourself and uh, do your presentation? Uh, my name is Jake Martin. I'm the campaign manager for the Let's Go Colorado campaign. Uh, and I'm going to kind of talk through a little bit of the policy here of what we're proposing, talk about how it affects Arvada, Jefferson County, and uh, the Denver area. Uh, for, we always like to start with a little bit of background on the initiative and why we're pursuing this initiative. Uh, in 1991, that was the last time Colorado changed the way it funds transportation in the state. And then it established a 22 cent per gallon gas tax. Since then, we've funded transportation the same way. Uh, and that gas tax is not indexed to inflation. So for a gallon of gas you bought in 1991, you pay 22 cents. For a gallon of gas you buy in 2018, it's still 22 cents. Uh, in 1991, we had 3.4 million people in Colorado, uh, and we spent about $126 per person uh, on transportation per year. Uh, since then, a lot's changed. We see it all around us. There's a lot more people here, uh, but the cost of goods has changed dramatically. Uh, in 1991, a dollar only goes about as far as 54 cents today, uh, really just due to inflation. This thing we don't really think about every day, but that's occurring kind of underneath the radar. What that means in costs is that costs have really increased. Uh, the cost of a car has increased 80 almost 80% for a Honda Civic. The cost of resurfacing a road has increased by 120%. And that just is the cost for asphalt and concrete and the, the tools to do that. But the other costs are property, uh, labor. We look at a gallon of gas, the cost has increased by 140%. Meanwhile, that fuel tax has stayed the same at 22 cents per gallon. We also see fuel efficiency increasing. In 1991, uh, a passenger car got 23 miles to the gallon. 2018, it's 30 miles to the gallon. That's an 18% loss when we look at uh, passenger cars, SUVs, trucks. Uh, fuel efficiency is a great thing, but the result of that is 18% less revenue for transportation. And lastly, the thing we're all aware of is uh, the population growth. Uh, this chart is uh, over the last 50 years, we can see that the number of lane miles in the state has increased by only 17%, but the population has grown by more than 160%. Just since 1991, the population has grown by more than 2 million people. So when we put all these things together, what it results in is a $9 billion project list that the state has for transportation that we're unable to fund. It also leads to a billion dollar a year shortfall for transportation and limited capacity for new, uh, new infrastructure. And as a result, we're spending about $69 per driver per year, almost half of what we spent in 1991. So all of these things really compound on one another to further the, the hole that we're in when it comes to transportation and getting around. Uh, for the last five years at least, but really going back, uh, I've heard people uh, in our coalition have been t working on this for 12 years. Uh, this coalition has been working together to find a policy solution. Groups here are Denver Metro Chamber, Colorado Contractors Association. Uh, those are really the two we read about a lot, but the coalition is much larger. Uh, when we look at Club 20 on the Western Slope, Pro 15 in Northeast uh, Colorado, the Ports to Plains Alliance on the Eastern Plains, the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Uh, throughout the state, we've built a coalition of folks really working for a solution, and it's a broad bipartisan solution. Republicans and Democrats, uh, the business community and the conservation community really working together. Over the years, they've looked at a lot of different options. How do we fund transportation uh, in a really meaningful, dedicated way? Uh, for Colorado. There's a couple options that have been floating around. One is a vehicle registration. Uh, Colorado has very high vehicle registration fees, so that wasn't really seen as an option that we could pursue. Uh, fuel tax was another option, and as we talked about, it's, uh, increasing the fuel tax doesn't really go a long way, and it's not long-term uh, reliable because of fuel efficiency. Uh, it also would require a very large increase in the fuel tax to really make a meaningful investment in transportation. Uh, the last piece is the general fund. Um, using dollars that the state already has. The challenge with that is for 25 years, we've been looking for new revenue to fund transportation. We've had band-aids along the way where legislators could find compromise, uh, but there hasn't really been a meaningful solution from the general fund. Uh, last piece is income tax, and I think we can all agree we don't really need to pay more in income taxes. 
So the option that we've settled on is a sales tax, and there's a few reasons why. Uh, one, it raises enough to address the problem, and I'll talk a little bit about the dollars in a second, but it's also a small amount that adds up. A couple pennies a day really adds up over a year and when we look at everybody in the state. And it's also paid by everybody at the same rate, including tourists. We have 80 million tourists a year in Colorado. They don't pay vehicle registration fees. Uh, they don't pay significantly in fuel tax. They don't pay income or property taxes. This is an area where tourists can really contribute. So the coalition is moving forward with a 0.62% sales tax increase. Uh, that is about six cents on a $10 purchase. That'll raise 667 million in the first year and bond for $6 billion in projects at the state level. And this will last over 20 years. In 2039, this will fade away. Voters will have the opportunity to look at this again. Throughout the coalition, there's been a lot of uh, talk about how these funds are distributed. Uh, the gas tax today is distributed to the state, it's distributed to cities and to counties. And we wanted to replicate that in a way that was really making a meaningful investment both at the state level, cities and counties, but also in multimodal infrastructure. So this revenue would be divided up between the state highway fund, receiving 45% of the revenue to invest in large state projects, counties receiving 20% of the revenue, cities receiving 20%, and multimodal receiving 15%. Uh, at the state level, this $6 billion in projects would uh, extend to 89 projects throughout the state. And there's a few here uh, that are significant for Jeffco. Uh, I-270 to get from the north suburbs out to Aurora, uh, it's a $220 million project. The I-70 Kipling interchange, this is a $64 million project. Uh, I-25 North uh, to get from the north metro area up north. But there's also projects uh, throughout Jeffco on C-470. At the local level, these dollars are unrestricted. So 20% of the revenue to cities, 20% to counties, and they only have to be used on transportation. Uh, we felt this was important so that the unique needs of Arvada uh, could be met while the unique needs of Grand Junction could also be met. They, are, they may be different, and we need local elected officials to make that determination on what projects need to be addressed. Uh, so it could be everything from street repaving to matching for state projects, bike lanes, improving intersections. Uh, Arvada in the first year would receive $4.5 million off of the 0.62 sales tax. Over 20 years, uh, if growth trends stay the same, it'd be $128 million. Uh, Jeffco would get $10.5 million in the first year and accumulating to about a little less than $300 million. Uh, we also included Adams. I know there's a little, a little corner of Arvada into Adams County as well. Uh, that would receive 6.1 million in the first year and 174 million over 20 years. The last piece of this is multimodal. And this really extends to uh, projects that involve uh, uh, mass transit, whether it's uh, what we think of here in the metro area or whether it's dial -a rides in the uh, rural areas, but also bike lanes, pedestrian improvements, whether we're uh, widening, widening a shoulder to allow for bike lanes or uh, adding sidewalks uh, along streets. There's three parts of this. The first is leveraging state and local dollars to repay bonds for large projects. Uh, one in particular, uh, there's a lot of talk of bus rapid transit in certain areas of the state. This could be used to pay for those projects. Uh, also funding local multimodal projects across the state. Uh, part of this revenue would go through Dr. Cog uh, and th through them be uh, dedicated towards specific projects. But then another piece of this, the last 15% of the multimodal funding would be toward interregional transit. So Bustang is a, a wildly popular project that CDOT has taken on to get folks from the Western Slope or Southern Colorado to the metro area and back. And this could also be funded for that. Uh, so adding it all up, we really are addressing three big parts of Colorado's transportation infrastructure. One is the large scale state projects on interstates and state highways, uh, prioritizing urban and rural multimodal mobility, but also providing cities and counties with the resources they need to meet their unique needs. Uh, so that's the policy. Uh, we would love to have the support of the city council and uh, open it up for any questions, if you have any. Mr. Marriott. A couple questions for you. <clears throat> so you said the gas tax percentage hasn't been raised since 1991. Do you know about how much the gas tax generated in 91? I, I do not know off the top of my head, unfortunately. Okay. Sorry. Any, think, any idea how much it generated in 2017? I think it was about $550 million in okay. the most recent year. Okay. Yeah. In 91, is it fair to say it was less than that? Uh, yeah. A lot yeah. less? Yeah. Okay. So while the percentage has stayed the same, the total generated has gone up 
by a bunch because there's more people, more cars, more gasoline being sold. Sure. Okay. Um, okay. I just yeah. wanted to know, be, be clear about that. Yeah. I think Let so. me ask you about that multimodal fund. Mm -hmm. So that's 15% of the sales tax collected. In my looking at just rough numbers, that means in Arvada, there's going to be about three, three and a half million dollars in sales tax collected that would go towards the multimodal part. How much of that would Arvada get to do multimodal with, or does that just all disappear to somewhere else? So the 15% for multimodal uh, gets divided up into three different categories. Okay. It gets a little fuzzy here, yeah, uh, okay. complicated. The first 30 million would go toward bond repayment, and the CDOT commission would select large projects that they would need to bond for, and they would be, uh, that 30 million each year would be used to pay that back. Okay. And then if you take that off, then the- That's the, about a third, right? I, I think that's about right, yeah. Okay. Uh, it kind of varies year by year. Sure. But, uh, if you take that back, then the remaining 100% gets divided up into two buckets. Okay. The first is 85% for local projects, and that gets distributed by the CDOT commission. They will develop a formula that distributes it to MPOs, like, like Dr. Oh, Cog, okay. and uh, to local projects. So they would determine projects that are not represented by an MPO, so if you're in, uh, Gunnison, for example, you don't have a metropolitan planning right. organization, so they would fund specific projects in Gunnison. Uh, and then the last 15% goes towards state multimodal mobility. So, and and what, is, what is that? Is that Bustang? That's Bustang, park and rides, okay. uh, large scale bike paths and okay. walking paths. So, so it sounds like Arvada could get none, it, or it could get some. I think it would vary by year, depending right. on the projects. But, but not likely to get anywhere near what we pay into that. No, and I, that's a good question. There's uh, since there's only 40% going, 20% going back to cities, 20% going back to counties, nobody really ends up 100% uh, whole unless there's a lot of state projects as well. Right, right. I, I just mean on the multi, the multimodal part of it isn't really, I guess part of the multimodal part is designed to be local multimodal projects, but you're not guaranteed any of it. It's a competitive, Correct. competitive granting process. Yeah. So in any given year, you might get some out of that or you might get none out of that. Yeah, you could correct. go years and not get none, or you could go years and get and get some each year if you can come up with those multimodal things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, question. On, on on this uh, this initiative, you're collecting signatures for. Is there any part about it that requires any kind of uh, additional, you know, uh, additional input by the state legislature or from the state budget? Uh, no, I don't believe so. The only part that would require the input of the state was the. Uh, through CDOT and the CDOT Commission. As but, far as input from the state, what do you mean by that? As uh, as? The CDOT Commission would have a lot of uh, reach in determining specific projects so to fund. They, they would get to decide how, how it gets yeah. spent, but there's no required match out of the state general fund or the legislature or anything, anything like that? No. Okay. The, the, uh, here's the reason why I asked, why I asked the question. So I've, I've got a, maybe a unique point of view on this, but... Uh, um, the legislature seems to have completely unprioritized transportation for a significant amount of time. I think it's been 10 or more years since they've spent a penny on transportation out of the, out of the state's general fund. Instead, they've elected to make other things priorities like Medicaid expansion and uh, school funding and this and that and, and, and whatever their priorities at the moment had been. But Recently, there was, you know, the deal for Para, for instance, was kind of crafted to, you know, to, to make that deal go. They required some spending by the state legislature, and I wonder why this doesn't also do the same. You know, in other words, if the state legislature has decided we're just not going to prioritize that at all, we want we want the citizens to go out and hook themselves up for that, and we don't want to have anything to do with it. It seems like there's an opportunity there to require at least some prioritization from them, but there doesn't appear to be. Am I right about that? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's different though. That was their action. That wasn't, wasn't this, wasn't this action. And that's a, that's a one year, one year that thing. But, well, I don't think so. I think, I, I think that's different, but, uh, um, yep. I think there is one thing. There was the uh, Senate Bill 267 last year, mm -hmm. which authorized the 1.8 billion in bonding for transportation. Uh, our initiative would keep that intact. 
So there's uh, Senate Bill 1 or there's another initiative being pursued this year. Both of those would, uh, for lack of a better word, rescind that. So ours would create a new dedicated revenue stream for transportation and allow that bonding to continue. So there would be, I think, in a sense, general fund dollars going toward transportation that we wouldn't disrupt. All right. Okay. Um, that's all mine. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Mr. Jones. Thank you. Um, could you go back to the uh, slide that showed um, the funding, what Arvada would get in the first year? Yeah. So, um, and I'm not really good at math, but um, so if I take that 128, 128 million and divide that over 19 years, that's about $6.7 million. Is that what you're saying? So what's the chain? What's the delta? Why is there only 4.5 million in the first year versus? It's a great question. So sales tax is a, it's a growing revenue source. So in this, we incorporate, I think it's 3.54% growth each year in sales tax revenue. Uh, so over 20 years, you end up with a greater than uh, average amount. Okay. And then, um, uh, so, and, and then go to the slide that shows kind of the potential projects. Yeah, that one. Um, I'm sure that you, Arvada is not unique in the sense that we have several state highways that run through our city, uh, Indiana being one of them, that's in desperate need. Um, and people who live on the west side of town, um, I hear a lot about that. Yeah. And um, how are you addressing those kinds as, as opposed to kind of these big state highways and putting money towards those as opposed to some of these smaller state highways? So the, the difficult thing I think for us to do is uh, there's some money dedicated in the initiative that would go toward maintenance uh, and even fiber along roads to, uh, for smart technology. And for that, it's difficult to pin down exactly where that money would be spent, but it increases the budget for those priorities. Uh, so there's, a, I think, a limited ability to address a, a lot of projects. We're really, $5 billion surprisingly doesn't go as far as we'd hope. Uh, but there is additional revenue for maintenance. Well, and I, I get that, but I think again, you know, this is a this is a statewide initiative. Um, you're hoping that you know this obviously gets passed, and you know, people who live in Arvada, they know that there's a state highway that is a bottleneck. Yeah. Um, and so when they look at it and they say, "Wow, I don't see any funding going to anything that's going to relieve my commute," um, I'm not going to vote for it. How are you going to address that? That is a good question. I'm not sure I have a, a great answer for that just yet. I think there's uh, one part of this is the local revenue and the local dollars, the 4.5 million uh, the city would receive each year that could be used. Well, so I, keep in mind, yeah. this is a state highway. Yeah. And the city of Arvada is already spending six to nine million dollars right now to improve one of your intersections on Indiana. Um, and, you know, we're planning to spend another several million, probably close to 10 million on another intersection that's a state highway. Mm -hmm. So we're already putting money there we can only do so much. And so, again, I think people are going to look at this and say, this does nothing for me and my commute. Um, they're looking at things that have absolutely nothing to do with me. So, I, I, you know, it might be a little short-sighted, excuse me, um, from a funding perspective. Uh, and, you know, I get you want to keep those major highways flowing. Yeah. Um, but I think you also have to think about, and again, I know that Arvada is not unique. Yeah. that there are other cities that have these same kind of problems, but um, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to have people ask me, so how much of that, if I vote for it, is Arvada going to get? And I'll say, well, we're going to get, you know, four and a half million and possibly upwards of seven million for the next 20 years, but none of that will be spent on Indiana. That will all be spent on local, our 1,500 lane miles. Um, so I think, it, again, I think it's just a bit of a disconnect um, that people are going to look at and scrutinize when they don't see something that's affecting their commute. So my last question is, so what if this doesn't pass? What's plan B? You still have a $10 billion shortfall. Yeah, there's a $10 billion shortfall. The state in Senate Bill 1 has uh, the ability to send a bond initiative to the voters in 2019, uh, but that's about $2.3 billion to, for, to address transportation. So there's still, even after that, there's a, an $8 billion gap. So. We feel that this is the right solution. Uh, we thought a half cent was the right solution. And the city of Arvada residents didn't. So anyway, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Mr. Fiverr. 
So I think that some of the questions you're bringing up are more for C dot, not necessarily them. Well, him, I but <clears throat> yeah, the yeah. Well, and, and I don't, I don't think we all live on an island. I think we all drive through these intersections at one point or another in our lives to get to the airport or get to downtown or something. And right now, I think you're in gridlock almost anywhere you go this day and age. Unfortunately, I think we grew faster than the sales tax at a fixed 22 cents or whatever it was. Um, you know, more wear and tear on the road. But, but my question, and I, it's, I guess, a little dangerous for me to bring it up being my position with Dr. Cog and stuff, is the multimodal. I still struggle. What were your guys' thoughts around the multimodal that that is a good investment to reduce uh, congestion on, on the highways? Uh, I think. I mean, what was, what's the thought process? I know there's, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess multimodal could be the bus thing. It could be the buses. Um, how many buses do we have in Sierra Nevada? Three? You know, we're the seventh largest city. We don't have very many buses. So I don't see a commitment with RTD in here. Did they come to you and, and say that they would increase bus service in Arvada? So there's, the, the I think it's a hard question, right? Yeah, that is a hard question, it's a good question. The multimodal funding, what we wanted to do was distribute it down locally. Uh, so it would come to us. It would go through Dr. Cog to. to, to oh. yeah. Okay, through Dr. Cog to us. Two cities and Which means, uh, is that through the TIP process? Is that the idea that that would happen? That may be too that. technical for me to answer. Um, Sorry. Well, I mean, because, I mean, we can do so many bike, bike paths, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, I don't know how much it, it addresses the mission and vision of our transportation issues, you know, which is to reduce congestion, improve commute, and, and create a safer environment for people to commute. Yeah. Um, so I think if we put some more energy, if I was to give you feedback on this, is, is uh, I struggle with RTD's commitments in a lot of these things. Um, I don't see RTD, you know, jumping up and saying, if this happens, we're going to get you an extra bus or we're going to make this route happen. I, I, see, I hear a lot of talk. I, I don't know. Is there a gold line up yet? Okay. Soon. Just curious. I Soon. thought maybe the mayor might have known something. But, you know. Maybe in July. We followed our end of the bargain by getting as much up. So I would ask this effort to reach back into RTD or other multimodal, as you would classify them, and and they should get into some commitments on what that could be. Um, you know, I, I, I was at the uh, subregion Dr. Cog meeting, and we talked about, you know, multimodal money for Wadsworth, but then I thought, well, what, what buses are you doing? What, what are you trying to achieve? And did RTD commit to doing bus stops along there? And no, but yet we were putting money in for a bus stop that may never be used. Right. So I just don't want to put bad money and try to promise things. Otherwise, scratch the multimodal. Let's just improve operations and capacity and call it a day. And, and I mean, that's really what I like to say is put the 15% into the local side and let us do our thing. You know, yeah. don't restrict us on that part, but I think it's too late, right? Is that, is that true? Well, here? let me. <laughs> it's like, damn, if I could put it in our pocket. Let me tell you better. that there were people in certain communities who wanted to have 30 to 50% dedicated to multimodal. So this was, I mean, this, this, is the, this was a negotiated compromise, exactly. Uh, there was a, you did not want to see this sausage being made, let me tell you. Um, and the, I think where we got to and why we finally got buy-in is that those, those multimodal dollars truly are flexible for each community's use. So that's the, you know, it's not because, trust me, there are plenty of people that have been part of this coalition who have been vehemently opposed to RTD, who, and, and all you got to do is go talk to the Boulders and the Lafayettes and the Louisvilles uh, and the Broomfields, um, but recognizing that if we've got multimodal dollars that we can use for first and last mile, any, that's more enticing, and, and there's any number of things. I mean, we could talk a, um, a circulator. We could talk, you know, something that we do different from RTD. So that's, that's where the, that's where the, um, the multimodal is more palatable rather than just total weight coming out. Do you have anything else, Bob? Okay. Mr. McGough, you're next. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering on the state projects that are identified here, are, those are definite. Those would be the projects. It's a good question. So the CDOT commission will actually finalize the list in July. 
Okay, so, but it's, so these are next to final? Next to final. Okay, so I'm wondering if there would be any problem then with the, the uh, projects at the county and the municipal level not being defined, kind of like uh, Mr. Jones had mentioned, you know, without, you know, without, would we need to come up with some definitive projects to go along with this uh, initiative? So that people would know how we would be spending the money, what they would be getting? Absolutely. That would be very helpful for the initiative process, uh, for us to be able to talk about what exactly would be funded. Uh, there's no requirement, but it would, again, be very helpful to us as we're talking to voters. Okay. But these are next to final, and what's at the county and what's at the municipal level is, those are not defined yet. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Ms. Miller? So I had a couple of questions. One was similar to what Mr. Pfeiffer said, was that are these percentages set in stone? And it sounds like uh, they are. I guess my question would be to you or to you, because you were part of the conversations along the way, is how, where did these percentages come from? 45% to stay at highways versus 20% to it, local? It, it's, it's, it comes from the original um, division that we get from the state right now in terms of the existing dollars that are coming in on the sales tax. And actually, we negotiated, because cities on the original only get 18%, and counties got 22%. And so, and the state got the rest, CDOT got the rest. And a portion of that went to multimodal. So, and actually, I will acknowledge that the governor helped us get us to an equal footing with the counties uh, and this was on the, the bill that was floating around last year. So we used basically the same formula as was negotiated last year. Again, the same coalition, the legislature bought into it last year and then it blew up at the last, you know, on the last days. But um, that's where the ratios came from. So okay. cities actually come out better with this than we do under the existing um, sales tax distribution. I just feel like there should be some algorithm in each part of the, the state, in each county, saying, okay, there's 85% of the roads in Jefferson County are city, so 85% of that extra should go to cities versus, you know, the 15% that the county roads where El Paso County would be completely different. So that's just my mm. math head going, that just doesn't make sense. But um, my other question was about marketing and, you know, with this initiative statewide, and are these presentations up on websites where they can be shared and videos and commercials and marketing have, it to get it done? Yes, yeah, so we have a website, letsgocolorado.com. Uh, it's just up lately. Uh, there you can download the fact sheet, endorse the campaign, sign up for updates. Uh, we'll have the presentation up there, and we can uh, email it as well. Sure. I think that's all my questions for now. Okay, Ms. Ford. So I, um, I'm not familiar with the tax that Utah has. Does, is anyone familiar with that tax here? Because just a little, just little, a little bit. bit. Because I, the the result of it that I saw was that the roads were absolutely beautiful. So I, I realize that Utah doesn't have the population that we have, obviously. But what what do you think is it is it that makes their roads work? well and be so beautifully maintained uh, i believe it's the public investment i don't have the dollars per driver spent in utah compared <clears throat> to colorado but i know it's it greatly exceeds colorado uh, so they've been over the years been able to make that public investment in transportation that we just haven't been able to in colorado okay thank you mm -hmm. so next steps and let me let me give you my two cents worth i mean we've got a lot of people who've been working on this a long time the um the What's going on right now is that uh, there are petition gatherers out. Uh, the group is confident that they will get it on the ballot. Um, they're a little bit more confident now because the gentleman who lives in Golden who had the no growth initiative, uh, Dan Hayes, has is, is decided not to run that. And so frankly, the, the home builders, the board of realtors, all those groups that were feeling like they were going to have to fund the negative campaign on that one are now going to put campaign dollars into this project. The budget, as I understand it, is in the ballpark of $9 million to, uh, for the advertising, for the promotion. 
of um, of of this campaign. So it's going to be interesting. And and as you know, Mr. Jones points out, you know, citizens of Nevada voted against a half cent um, sales tax increase just for our local needs. Frankly, I don't think it was the best campaign of all time. Um, and so it's it's going to take an incredible campaign, I think, to, to get this past the the polling numbers show support. Um, people talk about, you know, why did you go for 0.62? And again, um, that was the number that had been arrived at last year. It gets us closer to what we need. I can tell you that uh, God rest his soul, Mayor uh, Hogan and myself pushed pretty hard for a one cent um, from, and you know, there were others that pushed for a half cent and this was the compromise that was reached. So um, there's been a lot of, of good effort put into this and I think the message is gonna have to get out to the citizens. Got to your point in terms of you know, some sort of, because it's a statewide ballot, you have to have the language with certain percentages, so it can't be a floating kind of thing from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, and we all recognize that the Denver metro area, you know, raises greater than its proportionate share of the sales tax, um, and that money's gonna be distributed statewide that's gonna benefit, you know, all four corners of the state and the metro area is gonna be a donor region uh, to, to the rest of the state, but you know the metro area benefits from being able to get to the ski areas, to be able to get to our outdoor activities up in the mountains, to be able to move our goods and services around the state of Colorado. So this really has been viewed as an effort to benefit the entire state. It's the classic, you know, uh, rising tide raises all boats, and so, you know, those of us who have been very involved in this think that the statewide approach is much better than to do simply what like Colorado Springs has done where they've increased their sales tax just to benefit their region, but you know, doesn't get them the rest of the way to the, to the Denver metro area when they need to get here and things of that nature. So, um, you know, Jake's got his work cut out for him. Uh, I think you can tell that you know, even even with the mayor who's uh, <laughs> pretty invested in this, that I've got a council that's got some questions. And so, you know, I'm sure we'll have some more discussions. Well, thank you for having me. Okay, you bet. Appreciate it. Mr. Devin, next steps Thanks. on this? Next steps would be uh, if, um, based on feedback tonight, if council would like to have us schedule for a future council business meeting an action to endorse or take some sort of a position on this measure. Okay. What's our time frame, Jake, in terms of when you would need that type of? We would love to have it. Um, yeah, I know yesterday. Back. We would love to have it tomorrow. But, uh, petitions are due on August 6th, and really over the next two months, we're kind of making the rounds, going to councils, talking about okay. the projects. So I think great. sometime in June or July would be great. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Thank right. you. Thanks. I guess my sense um, for right now is let's have some discussions and see if we want to have um, staff bring back a, a uh, resolution in support or, or what other steps council would like to take. Okay, very good. We will be needing, are we ready? Oh, okay. Next, we're gonna have a presentation from the Arvada Police Department. Yes, uh, this is uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. This is, uh, this is this presentation is is um, the health of the um, uh, health of the city uh, presentation. This is something that councils asked for um, a few times, uh, and um, uh, after some discussion with the police department, we have uh, uh, assembled a presentation. And uh, I believe uh, Interim Chief Brady is going to lead us off. Good evening. As you know. But uh, maybe a few others may not know. My name is Ed Brady. I am the Deputy Chief with the Arvada Police Department and currently the Interim Chief of Police since Chief Wick's retirement back in December. I'm joined here this evening with Deputy Chief Link Strait, who will also be presenting. But I'd also like to recognize a few members of our command staff, uh, Commander Drew Williams, uh, Commander Mark Nazark over our Baker sector, Commander Michelle Moriarty over our Criminal Investigations Bureau, uh, Commander Eric Kellogg over Adam sector, our civilian operations manager, Colleen Eyman, and our bi business uh, analyst, uh, Kelly Newman, and our commander over administration, uh, Melanie Thornton. 
So thank you for having us this evening. As uh, city manager mentioned, we had spoken back in January about providing council with a state of the city or health of the city update. So um, that is what we're here to present tonight. And it also goes along with our newest uh, strategic council goal, which is safe neighborhoods. So in addition to growth and development, infrastructure, service effectiveness, and vibrant community, we have added safe neighborhoods to that. If you think back to the beginning of the year, you remember that it was a challenging time for law enforcement in Colorado. Beginning on December 31st, actually, uh, Deputy Zach Parrish from uh, El Path, I'm sorry, from um, Douglas County Sheriff's Department was shot and killed, unfortunately, by a gentleman suffering from uh, mental health issues. And then later in the month in January, uh, Deputy Heath Gum was killed in Adams County after he responded to an assault in progress and then ended up in a foot pursuit with that suspect where he was shot and killed. And then later in the month, Deputy uh, Micah Flick was killed investigating an auto theft um, incident. It was a challenging time for the Arvada Police Department as well because during that time, in between each of these shootings, we had two shootings of our own, if you'll recall. We had an incident on January 14th where officers responded to a suspicious vehicle down at the target. And after they contacted the suspect, they learned that that suspect had a warrant for a felony domestic violent case. Once the suspect learned that he might be arrested, he fled in that vehicle, upon which time he crashed the vehicle, and then he fled on foot. A perimeter was set up to apprehend him, and when he approached officers, he raised his gun uh, towards one of our officers. Our officers engaged him, but the suspect ultimately took his own life by um, shooting himself. After the uh, shooting of Deputy Gum in Adams County, we also had another shooting here. In that instance was another domestic violence incident, and that suspect too had a warrant. Uh, when officers arrived, he had left, and we began searching for him. We weren't able to locate him at that time, but a, a resident of Castlegate Apartments called us and said that there was a suspicious person who happened to match the description of this individual. When our officers arrived on scene, this person was in the laundry room. They ordered him out, he came out swinging with a knife, and unfortunately an officer involved shooting occurred and that suspect um, passed away. It seems that our encounters are becoming more violent um, in situations like this. The day before our second shooting, one of our officers actually tackled a suspect with a knife who looked like he was going to be engaged in a um, suicide by cop incident down in southeast Arvada. So these type of incidences have had their toll on um, our police department and our community. But with that being said, I want to assure you that the Arvada, the community of Arvada is one of the safest places to live, not only in the state, but in the nation. You may recall this article from USA Today back in the fall of 2017. They rated America's 50 best cities to live in. And third amongst those was Arvada, Colorado. And the reason that they cited, one of the reasons, was that Arvada is one of the safest cities in the country. That is one of our performance measures as well. One of our performance measures states that Arvada will be in the top 80% or better of metro crime cities with the lowest crime rates as benchmarked by our uniform crime reports. And as you can see from this table, we are second in the metro areas that we rate ourselves against. The citizen survey also indicated some of the things that our community members are concerned about. And the two highest priorities amongst those was traffic offenses and also car prowls, which we'll talk about in a little bit. That survey goes on to talk about the confidence in the Arvada Police Department. So among those who were asked how well we handle emergencies, 86% said they were very confident or confident in the way that we handle emergencies and 12% of those were neutral. And amongst those that ask how we consistently uh, enforce laws, 80% were very confident or confident, and 16% were neutral. Probably 16% who haven't had much contact with the police department. So I think those are very good indicators of how the community looks at the police department. 
But let me talk to you about some of the crimes that we're seeing, not only in Arvada, but really metro-wide and nationwide. But they certainly have their impact here. So I'll call this the circle of crime. And we'll start at the top with drug use. These are common drugs that we encounter here in Arvada and the metro area. And you'll see at the top there is marijuana. And it's interesting that in the six months that we evaluated marijuana uh, from November of 16 to April of 17, and then again that same time frame from 17 to 18, it looks like marijuana arrest went down, which obviously they did. But I want to assure you that marijuana is still an issue, not only in Arvada, but the metro area. You may recall that in 2000, Amendment 20 was passed in the state, which uh, legalized medical marijuana. In 2012, Amendment 64 was passed, which um, legalized recreational marijuana. But those didn't come without a toll. And a couple of my studies are old, but I still believe that these numbers are accurate. Uh, there, I looked at a 2014 National Drug Threat Assessment and a 2015 high to impact on, on marijuana in Colorado. And those studies showed that the THC content in marijuana when I started in about 1994 was 3%. Today it's at 17%. That's a profound difference in the effect of that drug and what our officers are seeing on the street. Marijuana users in high school over the last year, over a third of 12th graders have tried marijuana. Just less than a third of 10th graders have tried it. And 12% of our 8th graders have tried marijuana. Our traffic-related deaths have increased. From 2011 to 2014, it increased 92% of accidents involving marijuana. It went from 50 deaths in 2011 to 92 in 2014 that involved marijuana. Our emergency room visits in the state, and these are state numbers, not Arvada numbers, but emergency room visits increased 62% in that time frame as well. Another drug that you hear quite frequently on the news are opioids, heroin, basically. You can see that we've had more arrests in those two time frames. Uh, we, we doubled our arrests in op opioid and heroin cases. Methamphetamine, however, is the drug most commonly used, I mean, aside from marijuana. Um, and that, too, has increased over, over that time frame. Here's some more, I guess, interesting number on opioid cases. So the difference between this chart and the prior one is that this one just actually analyzes the cases that we've been involved in that involve some sort of heroin or, or opioids. And you can see that in 2013, it was about 330 cases. Last year in 2017, it was 552 cases. So these are cases where we may not have had an arrest, but that there was some mention of heroin or opioids in the case report, such as a child welfare check or a child abuse or a mental health issue or a disturbance where some sort of mention was made. And you can see the toll that it's had on the police department. In 2013, that was about 2,400 uh, hours from our officer's time. In 2017, that was over 4,400 hours that we spent on dealing with cases that involved some sort of opioid. Chief, can I ask you a quick question just about that statistic, Absolutely. if you don't mind going back? Yeah. Uh, so is, is that um, some of those, I guess, there's a terrible term for it, but you might call it casual opioid contact some yes. of it might be you know actually the the source of the crime or, 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 or part of it but is, is that increase in total opioid case hours is that in an environment where the reporting part is the same so that truly is an increase of contact with opioid yes I believe so our reporting hasn't changed and basically that number was obtained by doing a search for those terms right. associated with the case so based upon that, you can see that it, it increased a couple hundred in that time frame. It increased a bunch. And so um, of, of that, do you have any, any just sense for if you were to break that down between, you know, a case where it's a child welfare thing and there happens to be o opioids present, but nobody, you know, there's not, it's not dealing or it's not right. active use or overdose or anything like that. That's kind of different, you know, than that. Absolutely. Do you have any idea how those would break down into, you know, again, for lack of a better term, casual opioid contact versus, you know, true opioid crime? 
Um, I don't, I think I understand the question. As far as like uh, distribution mm -hmm. and actual possession of heroin. Or, or, or overdose or, you right. know, any, any, any of those things where that's really the, the center of the crime and not just a, a tangent to whatever the call was about. Yeah, I don't have a sense necessarily for that number. I would say it's a smaller portion of those cases. I mean, most of those cases uh, where that drug is involved to some degree. But the actual distribution and heroin um, possession you know, those are some of the cases. So last, for that six month time frame, it was about 47 cases. Uh, so that's just six months. So, you know, possibly double that for yeah, right. uh, the, the year. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you bet. We also hear a lot about heroin overdoses. And that is an issue here in Jefferson County. We were unable to pull exactly uh, the numbers in Arvada, but Jefferson County gives you an indication of where we're at. And so in 2014, there were 18 heroin overdoses, and in 2017, that was 28. I don't want to minimize those numbers at all. I mean, each, each one of those is a life and, and um, a very serious incident. But I also want to put it in perspective to you to what the other parts of the country are facing. There really is a heroin epidemic. And if you look at Mon uh, Montgomery County in Ohio, you can see a vast difference in the number of heroin overdoses. Now this is a county that has the same amount or actually slightly less number of citizens than we do here in Jefferson County. And so uh, they had 566 in 2017. So they are really suffering from this heroin epidemic. So what is our response as an Arvada Police Department? Well, many if not all of you know that we are part of the West Metro Drug Task Force. Our special investigations unit, that's basically, they're combined. And we have a sergeant and two officers down at the West Metro Drug Task Force. And they actively investigate drug trafficking organizations that are distributing this. So in one case that was uh, highlighted in the news recently, uh, they investigated a heroin drug trafficking organization that was very active to dealing heroin, uh, not only in Jefferson County, but in Arvada. And in that case, they brought forth 61 indictments against six uh, defendants. And then there were over seven pounds of heroin seized, and the total street value of that was uh, over a quarter of a million dollars. We are also involved in um, making sure that our officers have excellent training regarding recognition um, of drugs and the enforcement of those drug laws. And Deputy Chief Strait will talk with you in a little bit about our efforts in educating our youth regarding marijuana and other drugs. The second portion of this circle of crime is motor vehicle thefts. So before I talk about the thefts in themselves, I want to mention theft from motor vehicles. As you saw, one of our concerns from citizens were, was car prowls. And we've remained about the same in that six month period of theft from motor vehicles. But I'd like to mention to those that might be listening that 75% of those are preventable. 75% of those are from cars that are unlocked. 75% of those have purses, phones, computers out in the open. And for those folks that are listening, if they lock their doors and put away their stuff, they significantly decrease their chances of becoming a victim to people breaking into their cars. Motor vehicle thefts is a metro-wide issue in the metro area. You can see that we had a drastic increase from 197 to 265 during those um, comparison periods. And we also recovered more vehicles in our cities that were stolen from other cities. This next picture depicts that. Now I wanna point out that those numbers doesn't mean that it's, a, it's uh, located exactly at that spot. If you actually pan down in the software, you can see that stolen vehicles are recovered throughout Arv Arvada. And this indicates that it really truly is a metro-wide issue. So if you can look at the colorful one around the Denver metro area, it's about 2,100. Uh, mostly red, about three quarters red and um, a quarter green. So that means that there were about 1,500 motor vehicle thefts in the metro area in this one month time frame. There were about 700 or so recovered stolen vehicles. But those numbers, while not as severe as the Denver metro area, you can see that this covers the state of Colorado. Motor vehicle thefts is an increase, seems to be an increasing trend, and it is a statewide problem. 
The left chart indicates the most popular vehicles that have been stolen. So take extra care if you own a Honda Civic or a Honda Accord because those are uh, the two at the top of the chart. So I have a quick question. <clears throat> does, does, uh, you would think with the newer technology in these cars that it would be harder to steal them. That they're just, they figured out a new way to take them. Even with, well, like, there, the are cer there are certainly uh, systems like OnStar yeah. that would help us recover cars quickly. And I believe that someday, I don't know when that day will be, but when technology... Um, Three to five years. Maybe. <laughs> but the problem is you've got a lot of old cars that don't they have don't. that newer technology. But at some point, when cars do have the technology like OnStar, and it's throughout all the cars, the number of motor vehicle thefts that we investigate, I believe, will be drastically decreased. But it's just interesting. Like, a lot of these cars I see here now have the push-button star, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to have a fob. So they figured out a way to get around that, that system. Well, I have seen a system. Uh, actually, it was uh, international. I think it was in England where um, two people... I don't know all the details, but we were able to get the code off of the a keyless entry uh, with the system they had oh, and then enter that. and start that car. Mm. So unfortunately, as creative as the uh, car companies get, there's people who are going to find ways around those. Mm. Well, and now they're making devices to put your key fob in that basically blocks that RFI code or signal. Yeah, so that's, that's where I think I saw they can still like your credit card. Yep. They're still in that number. Mm. Okay. The last crime on the circle of crime that I'd like to identify is identity theft. So identity theft occurs when someone uses your name, driver's license, or social security m number to defraud you. Uh, a couple years ago, my wife and I were uh, almost victims of this. Um, somebody had hacked into her email system, cut off all communication between me and her by sending our emails to trash, and contacted our, the financial guy that we were using, asked him for $10,000. He almost gave it to him. Fortunately, he called us before he did and was able to get a hold of us, um, and no money was transferred. But you can see how elaborate that system is. The other part of this is counterfeit money and counterfeit checks. And you can see both of those have increased significantly during those two comparison time frames. So how does this happen? In some situations, it happened like it happened with me. Those people may not have even lived in the United States, and they were just looking for an easy target. Um, sometimes a victim just finds out that someone has opened an account in their name. Today I reviewed a Ask Arvada survey. Unfortunately, it was a good survey for our employee who did a good job, but it detailed an identity theft. Uh, this uh, victim was on her way back from a, a trip to Arizona. She had spent five days down there. Uh, she logged into her account and found that there was unauthorized charge to her TFC, TCF bank visa for $185. She didn't know who the suspects were. Um, again, she was traveling from Arizona, and she believed that the card number may have been acquired on that trip. Second way that this occurs is what I had mentioned earlier about people breaking into cars, stealing purses, stealing wallets, and taking the credit cards and other identifying information. And the third way that we've recognized most recently is that this is occurring at restaurants, where people um, may put a bag on the back of their chair get up, go get their food at the counter, someone grabs their wallet, uh, ID information, credit cards, and then they immediately go to some of the big box stores, you know, Home Depot, Target, or an Apple, and buy thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. They may also use that money to uh, barter for drugs or other goods. You may have seen in the news recently that uh, we had kind of a high-profile case in, uh, involving some uh, Romanian citizens who were in the state. They were skimming ATM, um, uh, skimming ATMs. They had withdrawn $1,000. And fortunately, we had captured their license on a video. And uh, Detective Nelson did a great job, was able to identify where they were at quickly, contacted them, and made an arrest. But that case is being uh, prosecuted federally. So we respond to these crimes in a number of ways. First is our crime analysis. So they're in contact with several metro area information sharing systems uh, or auto theft drug task forces or drug task forces, acronyms like CMAT or BATTLE or CATPAW, which are all different types of groups that they share information with. Obviously, when they get that information, they share it with our officers and investigators so that we have uh, accurate information to work with. Our patrol is well-trained and they're vigilant in their patrol efforts. 
our CSIs are um, crime scene investigation, and they do a great job. I think they're one of the most active CSIs in the metro area because they not only process uh, cars and, and property or, or people crime, but they also process property crimes like uh, car break-ins and motor vehicle thefts. And from that, we're able to get DNA or fingerprints in which to identify these suspects. So we're able to identify suspects, I think, um, in large part due to their efforts. Our CRIT, as you know, is our Community Response Impact Team. They work on problem properties, but mostly they work with the community in identifying the issues and coming up with plans on how to address those. And I'll be talking about a problem property here in just a second. Our West Metro Drug Task Force, as I mentioned earlier, and then our Criminal Investigations Bureau does a great job in following up on these cases and actually identifying new cases. Typically when they identify or when they make an arrest on one case, it'll clear a whole range of cases, whether it be additional motor vehicle thefts or identity thefts. So they do a great job in their investigation efforts. So before I hand the mic over to Deputy Chief Strait, I want to highlight this problem property. This was a highlighted at our recent base camp uh, for our safe neighborhoods. And this property became a problem in January 2017 when we started receiving calls for service. You see, an elderly lady of, the, of about 90 years old lived at this residence, and she lived there with her grandson. And neighbors started reporting suspicious activities that were consistent with narcotics and narcotics distribution. So of the 101 cases, this is just one of those. Patrol went out there and contacted the suspicious vehicle. They then found that the driver had a warrant and placed him under arrest. And per their search incident to arrest, they recovered 255 grams of methamphetamine inside that vehicle. That is a tremendous amount of methamphetamine. I spent four and a half years at the West Metro Drug Task Force in the early 2000s. And we came across that amount a couple times. So it's a significant amount. So this became a property on our problem property task force, which involves the city manager's office, our CRIT, our neighborhood services, and some other departments in the city. So our neighborhood services went out there and they contacted people in the back shed. They were living there. They had a mattress and other furniture set up in the shed. Um, they posted that as a no occupancy back in November of 2017. Now fast forward a little bit to 2018 and they com uh, completed another check on the residents. And unfortunately, while we believe the grandmother, you know, she ne wasn't necessarily a party to any of this, but she was the one responsible for the property. So she was issued a summons for um, structure for the shed and then also animal neglect with that cat that is highlighted there. And then going back to June of 2017, um, the, neighbor, uh, the people living in the shed must have moved out because they moved into these tents which were in the backyard, which is also uh, problematic. Uh, during one of our contacts, uh, one of the suspects in there who had a warrant fled, and when he was caught by the officers, uh, assaulted the officer. Luckily, it wasn't a serious injury, but it was an assault on a police officer. Our senior liaison detective began working with that residence, uh, but again, there were many code violations. Luckily, when this went to court, our city attorney's office worked uh, with the homeowner, the lady there, and uh, came up with a plea deal. And part of that plea deal was a no contact order with her grandson and no one else at the residence. So our crit unit assisted her immediately, went over to that residence, helped ask people to leave the residence with her uh, permission. And since May, we've had zero cases taken at that house. From January to April, there were 57 cases, but since this occurred, zero case reports have been taken. These are just some of the associates of that problem property. The one in the middle there uh, with the orange suit on was the grandson. Our investigations was involved in many of these cases. In fact, 11 of our detectives were involved, and I won't go over all those, but I will highlight a few. One of the saddest cases in this involved human trafficking and underage girls that were at that residence and were um, using drugs, but also involved in um, trading those drugs for sexual favors. That property involved what I spoke about earlier, recovered stolen vehicles and motor vehicle thefts. 
It involved all sorts of drugs, meth, heroin, marijuana. In fact, our uh, West Metro Drug Task Force filed seven cases there. And one of the cases you may be aware of involved an attempted kidnapping near a park nearby. Now, I think some associated that attempted kidnapping with uh, some of the living well showers that were being talked about at the time. But in fact, it wasn't related to those. It was an associate of this residence. So by clearing out that residence, I really believe that uh, we as a police department and as a city were able to clear out a lot of the problems for that community. And they are really one of the un unsung heroes here. While a lot of um, the efforts, and I've talked about our city departments that were involved, the units at the police department, that worked incredibly well to address this problem property, it was the community's involvement that really helped us out in this situation. You talk about community policing, you've heard problem-oriented policing, they really all come together in this scenario. Because without the community, we wouldn't have had the intel to be able to act on these uh, situations. So we were very grateful that we had that type of relationship with them. And lastly, the, the victim in this too was a homeowner, this 90-year-old lady who just wanted to help her grandson. And unfortunately, he was a drug addict and he brought his friends with him to create these problems. But we just didn't abandon her when we cleared up this case. Our senior liaison detective and our mental health co-responders went to that and helped her. So the grandson incurred a lot of debt for her. She didn't even know. I mean, she, she didn't get on the internet for anything and he incurred a significant amount of debt. So they worked with helping her clear that up, reducing the interest payments, getting it to a level that she could help uh, pay back some of this. But they also got her involved in the Senior Resource Center Chores Program to help her, um, you know, in, help her with other aspects of life and give her, give her a purpose in which to move forward with. So very grateful to our senior liaison detective and our co-responders for the great work they did with her. So I've taken a lot of your time and I'd like to hand it over to uh, Deputy Chief Link Strait to talk about our traffic issues, some of our future issues, and then our youth engagement. I get to start off with something else that we do very well here in the city of Arvada and the police department, and that is traffic safety. And I would, I would like to say that traditionally we have done so. In my tenure here in the police department, we have always had traffic safety as one of our priorities. We saw earlier in this presentation that it is also a priority for our citizens, which just makes sense. So to give you a sense of the cost of Ed, would you take care of that for me real quick? <laughs> if I read the directions here, I might have been okay. You're not the first. <laughs> oh, we got a new clicker now? There you go. There you go. Uh, I want to give you a sense of cost, and certainly there's, there's personal cost. When you're in a traffic collision, whether you're injured or not, you understand the, the personal cost of that time, damage to your vehicles, monetary costs. I'm going to talk about the monetary cost of the City of Arvada and the Police Department. As you can see here, the average cost of a fatal accident for the Arvada Police Department to respond to that and investigate it is over $6,000. The average cost of an injury accident is just shy of $500, and then the average cost of a property damage accident is a little over $100. To give you a sense of that, in two, uh, 2017, the Arvada Police Department spent $342,000 responding to and investigating accidents. So we have a vested interest in driving those accidents down too, not only for the safety of our community and the citizens that travel in it, but monetarily, it's a big cost. I talked about traditionally how the police department's been very good at this. Um, it is ingrained in our officers, in our supervisors, in our department, that traffic safety is a part of what we do. And while it is enhanced by our traffic officers, it is the primary responsibility of our patrol officers and our sector commanders to ensure traffic safety in the city. And this is an example of a traffic safety plan that was 
that was uh, created by Commander Portia Hensley in Charlie Sector. And I'll give you a sense of what you're looking at here. That, that picture on the top, top right with the blue um, graphs on it, charts on it, that is an indication of high accident location. So Commander Hensley could take a look at that. She recognizes where her accidents are occurring. And then that, that darkest blue one, that is on 64th between Sims and Ward. So she knows she has an, uh, an issue there. She can then take a look at this other chart on the lower left, and you can look at that and you can see that you have 35 broadside accidents and 45 rear end accidents. That's an indicator to her that she has a intersection problem. So these, most of these collisions are occurring at or approaching an intersection. So the commanders will then develop a strategy to address whatever particular problem this is. And in this, in this instance, it's intersection related. So they will look at enforcement, they'll work with traffic engineering, they'll look at education, and they'll try to understand what is, what is happening, what they can do. They're going to make sure that they're working the appropriate times of day and the days of week, that the enforcement is targeted, so it's actually driving down accidents. And if we do that right, you can see here that in the first quarter of 2017, if you compare over the first quarter average of the last three years, in Charlie sector, uh, Commander Hensley was able to drive down accidents by 18%. That's a significant cost saving and it's certainly a significant saving to, to the person who has been in that accident. So that's the kind of thing that we want to see. That's the kind of thing that our, our uh, commanders are involved in when we talk about traffic safety. I also want to talk about, I talked about how we did a good job with this. I think it's important to put this into context and tell you how we do as compared to other jurisdictions. And in this case, we have Lakewood and Westminster. And to give you a sense that 3.9, this is normalized by population. So that's 3.9 accidents per 100,000 residents for a year. And in Arvada, we have 3.9 as compared to Lakewood, who has 5.4, and Westminster has 6.1. So we're going to, even though that number is lower than our neighbors, we're going to continue to work on traffic safety and make sure that we're doing what we can so people can drive through and visit Arvada and be safe. The next thing I'm going to talk about are societal issues. And the point I want to make here is we deal with the police department with mental health, we deal with homelessness, and we have specific strategies to address that. We have our, our co-responders who are trained to deal with mental health. They come out and assist our officers. And we also have an uh, Old Town Liaison Officer who deals specifically with the, the homeless issue. But the point I want to make here is that this is a large societal problem with a law enforcement component. And if we look to law enforcement as a complete solution to this, we're going to fail. We're not going to address the broader, varied issues that really drive this. And Ed was talking earlier about um, opioid use, drug use. If you talk about homelessness, mental health, and substance abuse, you're really talking about three things that are driving this. That's what we're seeing, that a, a lot of the homeless population that we see, that's what's driving that. One of, those, one of those things, mental health or substance abuse. What I'm suggesting is we can't let these problems just default to law enforcement for the solutions. We have to have a broader approach, more varied approach. To give you a sense of what the impact on the department is right now, the Arvada Police Department responds to, on average, 2.5 mental health calls each day. And of those, 42% of those result in a mental health hold. That means the officer or co-responder is working with that individual, doing an evaluation, and then ensuring that they are institutionalized, that they are taken down, taken down to an institution and evaluated for their mental health. You can imagine the amount of time that that takes and the amount of resources that that takes from our officers. We're very um, pleased with our co-responder model and what we're getting out of that. We want to make sure that we continue that because that takes a load off of our, off of our officers. We're also seeing less repeat um, customers because we're hopefully getting them the right resources at the right time initially. Quick question. Sure. Troy. So um, in that case, if, a, if one of your patrol officers encounters someone that has a mental health, health issue, they're calling these co-responders and they're coming over and taking over that scene to release your officer to go out and do other things, or how does that work? Um, partly, yes. We don't leave them there by themselves with that. Obviously, they're not police officers, and if something turns bad. So we make sure that there are officers with them, but they'll do a lot of the follow-up. So they'll, they'll certainly come out there and they'll help the officer on the scene. 
but then once they leave that scene they can ensure that the appropriate resources are applied to that person that they're getting the help uh, the help that they need and all of that so the officer doesn't have to do that right okay thank you I think another thing I told you that 42 percent of those um, contacts result result in a mental health hold I think it would be interesting for you to know too that five percent of those are in our schools so tells you the, the issues there and what percentage are city council <laughs> <laughs> the rest <laughs> it's not a laughing matter but you got to lighten it up every once in a while there you go i'm going to look to the future here a little bit and one of the things i want to talk about is our whisper creek community station uh, we are on schedule to break ground later this month and we anticipate opening in april of 2019 one of the things we did when we built this, this is the third community station um, that we've built, that we enlarged our community room, and that was in direct response to the outpour from the community, the use of those community rooms, and the desire of the community to want a larger place to meet and do business and to use those in the varied reasons, or varied uh, ways that they're used. So we're excited about that. I wanna point out that though we don't yet have the building, we already have in place the staff, the supervisors, and the command officers to run that. We are currently running a Delta sector, command and staff, out of Charlie sector. It's a little cramped there. We've kind of overloaded that, but we are ready to move into this Whisper Creek station the day the doors open and staff and deploy out of that. Next thing I'm going to talk about is regionalization. Um, one of the first things is... I think you've, some of you have heard about JEFCOM, the Jefferson County Regional Communication Center. We transitioned from our own um, comm center, PSAP, in March of this year down to JEFCOM, which is eight member agencies, which includes police and fire, and then every other agency in Jefferson County is serviced by JEFCOM. What we intend to do once we get completely up and running we get our staffing to either full or near staffing. We anticipate that we will improve our 911 call answer time. This is for the citizens I'm talking about right now. We'll reduce hold times and the abandon rate. So the abandon rate is that there's some disconnect. They, they hang up before we get to them or something like that. We want to make sure that we de decrease that. We're going to have improved time to dispatch and improved response times. We're going to make sure that we have the right responses. We have the right resources and that the right resources are being dispatched with the right capabilities. We're gonna have the ability to dispatch resources that optimize response times, and we're hoping to have a more seamless um, communication across the county. What was happening before is if somebody needed a fire, had a fire emergency or a, um, some type of a health issue, they would call 911, it would come to the police department, and the police department would then transfer it to the fire department. We're trying to and we'll eliminate that process in um, this new comm center. We'll also have the ability to talk to other agencies in Jefferson County on large events that will all be coordinated through one center and try to, instead of trying to patch radios together is what we've done in the past. West Metro Drug Task, uh, Drug Task Force, uh, Chief Brady talked about that earlier. Uh, our involvement in that has been very successful. Our Jefferson County Regional Crime Lab, and I will tell you that is one of the ones that, that I am most proud of. I think that lab serves us very well. And let me give you a sense of how it, do, how it does serve us. Ed talked a little bit about our ability to send in property crimes and have those processed. What we wanted to do when we joined the uh, Regional Crime Lab is we wanted to have a larger say over what we had processed, what crime scenes. If we're reliant on a state lab or an outside lab, they mandate what we can and cannot have processed, and it may not be important to them. They're only going to want the homicides and the serious person's crimes. Well, we may recognize in Arvada that we're having a, a property crime um, issue. We want to understand who's breaking into our cars or our buildings or what have you. So we have had great success with that, with that. and we actually have solved some pretty significant metro area crimes because of our crime scene investigators processing, yes, a property crime. So that's important to us. Our critical incident response team, not to be confused with CRIT, this is CERT, uh, and this is our, another name for that, this is our shoot team. This is the uh, team, countywide team that investigates officer-involved shootings. 
As an example, when we had our two officer-involved shootings at the beginning of the year, you can imagine the amount of resources that goes into that. So the Arvada Police Department has the responsibility to investigate the criminal aspect of that. The shoot team will come in, or CERT, will come in and investigate behest of the DA's office to ensure that there was no criminal event that occurred um, by the police officer. So they will come in and investigate an in-custody death or an officer use of force that results in serious injury or, or death. Um, actually, when we had the DOJ come out here and review us uh, for, that, for our last grant that we got to add police officers, uh, we talked about this and they asked me to provide them with our policy because they were interested in using this as a national model because they were uh, very impressed with how this works. So we're very fortunate to have the partnership with the other agencies to do this. We have SWAT. Um, we, Jefferson County, Golden, uh, have a regional SWAT team. We're looking at a regional records management system. And there is a potential for a family justice center that we are just now exploring. So regionalization has been very important to the Arvada Police Department. It has allowed us to do things that we would not be able to do on our own, with our own resources. And I'm going to close this, this on a uh, kind of a positive note, and that's youth engagement. I'm not going to talk about all of these uh, in detail. I'll give you a, a highlight on some of these. But I think you'll get a flavor of what the police department does with youth in, in our community. Really one of the cornerstones is a school resource officer program. The Arvada Police Department started this program here in 1995. We currently have eight school resource officers. Four of those are assigned to our high schools, three of those are assigned to our middle schools, and we have one that is assigned to the elementary schools. When you talk to them, they'll tell you that they have three main purposes when they SROs. They'll tell you the first purpose is to be a police officer. And part of being a police officer certainly is to ensure the safety of that school, the students, and the teachers to any type of a threat. In that, all of our SROs are trained to be a single officer response to an active shooter. They're all equipped with the appropriate equipment to include rifles and vests to address that. Now let me make, make sure that, it, that, that you understand this. When we ask a, an officer to go into a shooting by himself or herself individually, there is a great likelihood that that officer will sacrifice their life. They understand that, they agree to that. And we make sure that we have that conversation with them. That is part of that single officer response. That's a recognition. You're going in there to draw fire, distract the shooter. And every one of our SROs has acknowledged that threat and has accepted it. The second thing that they'll tell you to do is counselor. Certainly counselor to the kids, but they find themselves being counselor to the parents and counselor to uh, the teachers. And the third thing they do is their teachers. They teach classes, a wide range of classes. Uh, they teach you know, high school classes, junior high level or uh, middle school level classes, and they also do classes and training for the teachers and parents. So they're very active in their schools. And if you can imagine, these schools are a little microcosm of a, a larger city. Anything that we have, domestics, drug use, assaults, all of those things are occurring in the schools and the SROs are dealing with them. Mr. Pfeiffer, do you have a question? Oh, no, you can keep going. I'll wait till the end. Actually. Okay, I'll wait till the end. Yeah. Okay. Um, quickly, I'll go over the rest of these. Um, the Marijuana Impact Grant. Kelly Newman, our business analyst, was able to apply for and we received a grant for $79,000 from the Colorado Department of Local Affairs. I think it's important to say the reason that we can apply for these grants is because we don't have marijuana dispensaries in the city of Arvada, so we're eligible for these grants where others may not be. And the highlights of this is um, we were able to receive 100 Chromebooks for Arvada High School traveling bedroom trailer for the parent and that is where they go in there and they hide uh, drugs and show the parent how difficult or how easy it is for the kids to hide drugs in their room and how difficult it may be for the parent to actually go in there and find them. So this is targeted, it's going to be targeted at um, select high risk students and it's not only going to be for students, it's going to be for fifth to 12th grade. It's going to include their parents the students, elementary school focus, they'll have an aspect of that, a middle school focus, and a high school focus. And then, the, and then the fourth piece of that is a focus on the parents. Uh, badge Buddies. This was um, created by our 
school resource officer in Arvada K-8, where she um, created a program where students at Arvada K-8 and police officers became basically pen pals, and they exchanged written uh, letters throughout the course of a semester. At the end of that, they had a pizza party and everybody came out, the officers came out and met all of their um, badge buddies and had a, a very nice time. You see this one little girl up here running to meet her badge buddy. An interesting story about that is we didn't know if we we're gonna be able to use that picture because of her home life and the estranged aspect of her father. And we had to ask permission to put that on her Facebook because it was just such a great picture, her excitement to see her uh, badge buddy there. The Cop Rock program, um, basically what this is, it was intended to find a way to get our community out and talking with each other, getting them involved. Certainly if they found the rock, we encouraged them to take a picture of that, send it to us, we could get it posted. They could either go hide the rock again or they could keep it, it's up to them. Our Explorer program, we have had an Explorer program here for 30 plus years. Um, this is intended to introduce young people to law enforcement, give them a sense of what the career is about, T uh, teach them skill sets that uh, would be useful in law enforcement. We currently, did I to say we have 16 in the program, and the age range to be part of the Explorer program is between the age of 13 to 21. Once you turn 21, you're no longer eligible to be part of the Explorer program. The Teen Academy, Teen Academy actually starts uh, today. We had we have 27 attendees. We had 33 people uh, apply for it. We do put people on a waiting list. Um, they will go over um, SWAT, dispatch, uh, distracted driving, crime scene investigations, arrest control, building searches, kind of get them a little sense of what goes on in the, in the world of law enforcement. Friends of uh, Arvada K-8. Uh, this group was created to enhance a relationship between police and fire and the staff and students of um, Arvada K-8. Our city employees are, have been involved in this, and I think it's important to note that they just received a 21st Century Learning Center grant to fund after-school programs for the next three to five years, and the Arvada Police Department will be involved in that. Uh, we also have the Arvada High School Working Group. It's a community partnership. Uh, it's to address low income, homeless students, and anybody with educational inequities. They're trying to make sure that when they go to school, they have the equal opportunity to be there, plugged in, focused, they're not worried about, you know, whether they have the, what they need to, you know, their personal care or food or what have you. They have everything they need so when they're in school, they can actually participate. This group actually, we saw that we're gonna get 100 Chromebooks. This group was actually the group that required or asked for those Chromebooks. It was granted through that at uh, marijuana grant. And then we'll close with this one, the Oberon Bicycle Club. And this is a kind of a great story. For those of you who know Gordon Beasley, one of our officers, um, back in 2013, uh, Gordon was biking to work as an SRO, and he would bike by some kids, and he asked these kids to join in in the bike. So they would just ride to school with Gordon, and it kind of caught on. And so now we actually have a program, the Oberon Bicycle Club, every Thursday between 2.45 and 4.45. Any student with a three-speed bike, 10 rider limit, can go out on a bike ride with Officer Gordon Beasley. So that is our attempt to make sure that we're engaged with the youth, that we're staying involved with them. With them. I guess I do have one more. Um, and then our latest is kids and cops. And, and the reason this is important is, I think most of us have seen a, a pamphlet that law enforcement gives out to kids or to some uh, community group. And in that pamphlet, it's basically, basically an expectation of how the police department wants you to respond to and interact with them. So we wanted to reach out, but we didn't want to do that. We wanted to hear from the students what they wanted from their police department how they wanted to engage us. So what we did is we created a youth council. And that council is responsible for the creation of this website, which actually acts like an app 
uh, and the artwork here. So they went through the topics. They wanted to know. These were the topics that they wanted to know about. This is the information that they wanted to have answers to. So they can go in there to any of these links, and it will tell them about that topic. It will tell them when they need to contact the police. It will attach them to Safe to Tell, and it gives them resources and availabilities, and it gets them plugged in. This is something that they continue to work on and that we are being responsive and listening to them, not telling them what we expect from, from the youth community. Okay, does anybody have any uh, questions on any of, of what we presented tonight? Mr. Pfeiffer. Well, I had to dig really deep for a question. So it's <laughs> probably a relief for all of you since I've been asking for a while. <clears throat> Could you go back to, well, actually you don't have to go back. So on the Jefferson County crime, regional crimes, uh, whatever you call it, the CSI, right. yep. is there, have you seen an increase in, in response from the crime lab compared to the state just because of the use and, you know, everyone got excited over it and everyone diverted everything to the regional one versus the state one? Has that impacted response time or anything? Um, so uh, let me clarify, you have to be a partner uh, in that lab. So it's only, it's Jefferson County, it's Arvada, it's Wheat Ridge, Lakewood, those are the partners in that. And they will service some of the real small communities, but this isn't st the um, statewide yeah. access they don't have to this But lab. even within Jefferson County, I mean. So yes, our ability to have scenes processed has increased. The success of this on the front end was, I mean, we expected it to be successful. We were surprised at how successful it was. So some of the things that we measure is the number of cases that we submit. We want to know the number of those cases that are actually, we get a uh, APHIS or CODIS hit, that's a fingerprint or DNA mm -hmm. hit on it. And so our uh, APHIS and CODIS hits have gone up. We actually asked for another DNA analyst um, after we got this going because of the success and the use of it. So if I think I hear what you're asking, our ability and access to a lab has increased. So yes, our use of that lab has increased. And is that yeah, it, it does. And, and do you believe that, uh, what was the average response time from the state versus now the Jefferson County yeah. one? Uh, you know, I would just be, you know, I'd just be giving you a guess here, but it could, take, it could take months for us to get a response time from the state. Actually, it could take, it could take over a year depending on what the case is. We're getting our cases returned now. Uh, if it's a significant case, we can make a phone call and say, we want it now. It's almost, not quite, it's yeah, almost right. like CSI on TV though. We can, get, <laughs> we can get returns in a week if it is that critical to us. The standard cases, nothing's really taken us more than a month to get back. Okay. So I don't have any other questions other than comments. Uh, one, I, thank you, Mark, Devin, for f putting this on here. I was going to say finally putting it on here. Because Mark. I really do believe that this, this presentation was exactly what I was looking for, just to get a, a rounded sense of what our community is doing and how are we interacting, what are the positives, the good, the bad, the ugly of our community. Because we go to regional and national and state level conferences, but I didn't feel I had a good grasp from the views of, of the health of the city without some better data. And uh, I applaud putting this together. Seriously, I have several emails I have pulled up with all the questions, and you've answered them all dating back from two years ago, and you knocked them all out of the park, so I appreciate it. The second thing I like to, well, actually I actually have a few things. I like seeing the command staff here. I like the fact that you're here, and you know, we don't see you all the time and don't need to be here all the time, but it's good to see you all united and hearing that vision and hearing the same message and hearing what we have back. So I applaud having your command staff all here. Also, uh, I've always had a concern around youth engagement, not necessarily with the police department, just the city engagement in general. You know, the judge does his thing or did his thing. I'm very excited. And some of this I did not know how de in depth you did with the youth engagement. And when you have almost a third of our population is under 18, this is really critically important for our community that you have that relationship. And I applaud the police department in going way above and beyond. And the officers I see in those pictures, those SROs, I uh, have to agree are hands down some of the best people. Having a teenager that's unfortunately has interacted with a few of them, um, it's been... It, it's helpful, right? Uh, they become a friend to, to those kids. But that, that's, that's just one section of our police department. The entire police department does a great job, and it's, it's nice to finally see some, some highlights here in this forum where our council gets to see this. So 
again, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for getting on the schedule finally, and uh, keep up the good work and be safe. Thank you. Mr. McGough. Yes, thank you. Um, when you were talking about the societal issues, you mentioned the mental health co-responders. I'm wondering if you might remind us, too, of the role of Jefferson County mental health in their taking over of the Arapaho House and the services that they provide or that are available to us. Uh, we are a partner with them in the co-responder model, if that's what you're asking. So, Well, I'm wondering, too, about the, the residents you know, being able to deliver clients to a place close by. Oh, I, I, when I see what you're saying, yes. So you're, you're referencing that we have access to actually take somebody there where they can receive resources. So yes, yeah. um, Arapaho House is no longer there. And so we have, and I, I don't know if I can speak to the details as, as well as some of the other people here, but um, we now have access to that through Jefferson County Mental Health where we can take people with substance abuse issues or other issues and they can receive the care and, and that they need. And doesn't that, ha that has a significant uh, impact in reducing the amount of officer time involved that might be involved in either finding services or transporting to a more distant location? Absolutely. And actually that is one of our focus measures where we are measuring the success of our co-responder model to measure how much of officer time we're saving. And you're absolutely right, uh, Mr. McGough, that we can show that because of our co-responder model, we are saving significant officer time and we're not having the repeat calls out there because we're getting them plugged in through Jefferson County Mental Health with the right resources on the front end rather than repeated phone calls from police. And let's be honest, our officers are fantastic but they are not mental health professionals. I mean, and they don't have the skill set and the resources really to offer. So this is a key component in our future um, efforts to address mental health in the community. Yeah, thank you. I just think it's important to acknowledge the, the role and the benefit of the Jefferson Center for Mental Health in yep. being available to our police Absolutely. department, to our city. And it goes along with that. There, there needs to be partnerships. If we just lay this at the feet of police and law enforcement, it's gonna be a difficult uh, road for us to hoe, yeah. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Thank you. Um, well, I, I just have a couple of comments. I don't have any questions. I, I really appreciate this presentation and um, I really appreciate all of you. Uh, I've had the opportunity to, I think, meet almost all of the command staff. Um, I know there's a few that aren't here tonight, but uh, it's amazing to watch um, your command staff work with your sergeants and your sergeants work with the officers. Um, having been on a, a few rides and, and seeing them in action um, and seeing how that kind of flows back up, you know, from a communications perspective, um, I think I just, you should be commended for um, the department that you run and for uh, the officers that you have. Um, it's, I'm just constantly amazed. Um, going back to what Bob said about the SROs, <clears throat> I'm reminded of a, of a situation where a young woman was involved in some drugs in a school. And uh, she recently uh, recognized the SRO as kind of her uh, favorite teacher. Um, and uh, I think that's, that just is a testament to um, that counselor that you were talking about. Right. And, and the way that those kids view them and, and having those SROs in the, school, in the schools, um, I think is critical. Um, not just for safety, but for teaching the kids what it's like to interact uh, with someone uh, who's a police officer, or someone in authority. Um, because I think sometimes in schools that's lacking today. Um, but again, I just think that uh, uh, those that I've had the opportunity to uh, interact with on your staff, both from a, a command staff perspective all the way down to your officers. Um, class, just a classy group of people. Um, and, uh, and I'm, uh, as a citizen, uh, happy to know that we've got those kind of officers here in Arvada to, to look after me and my family, so thank you. Thank you. Mr. Marriott. A uh, quick question for you. You know, one of the things in your presentation that, that jumped right out to me was that comparison chart you had about the, the amount of traffic accidents uh, in Arvada versus our, kind of our neighboring communities. And I wondered if you had any idea why that, why that is. I mean, I, 
I would expect there to be some differences, but that, that was a giant difference in, in rate. What, do you have anything to attribute that to? Well, you know, it certainly could be some of the roadways that are going through those jurisdictions, but I will, I will tell you that uh, in my tenure here, traffic safety has always been a priority. It was, it was pounded into me as a young officer that it was my responsibility, and when I had time to go out there and engage in, in traffic enforcement, that was an obligation that I had. And I think the other thing is that if you just look at enforcement for the sake of enforcement, it's very ineffective. And Arvada takes a different approach. We certainly believe in enforcement, but there's a reason to it. And it has to be targeted, and you have to have some intent and some intended outcome in that enforcement. We can go out there and write all the tickets that we want to anytime we want. Uh, we can go out here, and within half a block, we could stop somebody and write a ticket. Uh, that doesn't go a long way with, with um, building that trust between the police department and the community. But if we can say when we're out there doing enforcement, that we are here for a specific reason, and that reason is to increase traffic safety. That reason is to allow you to drive through this intersection or this part of town without getting in a wreck. People understand that and they respond to that. We're not just sitting in a, a fishing hole writing tickets for the sake of writing tickets. And I, I truly believe that that's a piece of it. That's what our officers are out there trying to do. Yeah. No, that's great. I, it's, a, it's an amazing statistic, and, and I knew there had to be some part about it, but good for you guys for, for doing that and doing that over long term, because um, that's really the, the true result is fewer traffic accidents, not necessarily more, tra more tickets written or fewer tickets written. It's, Correct. It's, it's actual result. One last question, and, and that was um, uh, you had a presentation about pro a problem property, you know, kind of an example of a problem property, and I know some years ago we talked here about you know problem property ordinances and what we could do and what we couldn't do. How do you think your tools for uh, dealing with problem properties are now with the way you're organized and the strategies you have to, to take them on? It seemed like at least from that example that you gave that, uh, that you seem to be you know, pretty effective. I think we have the appropriate tools. And we obviously we understand that you always have that balance. We don't want to do anything that is that is outside the law that we do anything appropriate. And because we have a, the relationship that we have with the other city departments, we're able to bring all that to bear. And what Chief Brady mentioned earlier, I think was really a key to that. We can have all the tools we want to, and we can have all the great ideas, but if we don't have that community that's out there that feels that they can engage us, they can call us, and they expect that there's gonna be some outcome, we're not gonna get very far. So that community piece of it, when you're talking about the tools in our tool belt, is, is the biggest one that we have. So I believe we have the tools necessary. Now, I'm not gonna tell you there's not gonna be times where we're not gonna be frustrated because we recognize something and it takes a little time and it takes a lot of effort to get all of the, the information and the intel that we need to act on that. And we know that there are crimes going on and we know that there's, there's criminal activity and so forth. But we're pretty persistent, so we right. get on something, we'll, we'll keep at it. Great. Thank you very yep. much. Ms. Miller. Thank you. Um, one thing I didn't hear anything about, I, this isn't related at all to crime, but I think it may touch your senior resource officers, um, or school resource officers, I'm sorry, is um, teen suicide. And if, they're, if they ever have any interaction with that, with the badge buddies, being able to write letters to police officers, it's it's growing, it's an incredibly growing number. And um, just in our own family, my stepson's roommate killed himself um, less than three months ago. And then last week, a friend that he went to high school with, and Saturday night, we're doing an, a, an event for, to raise funds for teen suicide. I, I feel like it's everywhere and it's growing. And I, I just wonder if your officers are, I'm sure they're, trained to have those conversations, but what does that look like? Uh, that's a great point, and certainly it's difficult for, for me to understand the pressures that a teen is under in today's world with all the social media and all that they are bombarded with. So what we have in place for that is we have safe to tell, and then our, our kids and cops gives them access to that. So if you have a friend that you are concerned about that, is, that you may um, believe that is, you know, considering uh, doing something suicide or something like that we have the availability for that person to reach out for them and not be identified themselves and then we can insert ourselves and get them help and yes our officers have 
um, the training and ability to engage that person. But I think it's important that we wouldn't expect our officers to have that long-term counseling session with them. We wouldn't put that the responsibility on there. We would, we would, so the officer's role in that is to get that person plugged into the appropriate resources. Jefferson County Mental Health may be it or any other uh, resources available to them. But they do understand, they do recognize that, they do recognize some of those signs. And I think the, the biggest thing that we can do is communicate that to the teens and let them know that it's okay if you think you have a friend that is at risk to reach out and get them help. I'm not sure if that completely answered it, but. Mr. Pfeiffer. Sorry, one last time. Second bite. You're right. It, it is, it is. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I sit here because I'm always in Oz and, and, and yeah, no, um, always in Oz with your performance and your officers. And I don't think we do enough to give credit to everyone in the department. So I would just real quickly, one, you did start a DUI program, right? Um, which I we think did. has been effective. You didn't bring anything up about that. So maybe next time we can do that. I, that's a huge issue, uh, I think, in the metro area. And I'm glad we're kind of taking that on. Um, because I, it always worries me personally and my family to be out at night because you see how much uh, there are more DUIs than I, I could ever remember, but you can see them. So I appreciate Arvada taking an effort there. Um, but, you know, just hearing my peers talk, I've had some personal issues with, uh, with uh, not again, an issue where we, had, we have two officers here every Monday night and how boring it could be, but they've been here for years. They change, they're not the same people. But, but I have to say, in my, I had a, an issue with one of, uh, well, with my oldest son, and one of these officers showed up and befriended my, my oldest son. He was having troubles in high school, you know, just a kid, just having problems in high school. And just, you know, not knowing who I was and who he was and stuff and, and the, the friendship that was grown out of that. And this is just a normal officer, street officer, doing his job and doing it above and beyond. So, you know, personally, you, your team, gives 110% no matter who it is, where it is, when it is, all the time. I wanna also add that even just recently, I'll bring it up, the highway incident where we had those 11 children in the, in the van uh, that I pulled up on, your officers didn't know who I was. I was just a highway worker in their eyes. But I got to observe um, their organization, figuring out the strategy, figuring out how to solve it, and it was always with a smile, with a concern, with passion, even under the stress of, of, it was a busy Tuesday night, which is crazy, but it was a busy Tuesday night because I could hear the radio, and they kept it calm and collective for our uh, visitors that were going through our state. They were not even citizens of our, of our state. So, you know, um, observing that now, granted the sergeant saw me when I walked in with them, that changed the whole story, but I got to see two hours of officers doing a really great work which was nice because it's kind of behind the scenes. You don't get to observe that all the time. So I, I just wanted to highlight those. I think that's important to know that we do see that and we were honored and blessed like every one of my council members and my peers have said uh, to have such a fine police department at, at all levels, all facets, and all groups. So again, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll certainly echo what's been said. A couple of things that you know I think we've got to continue to focus on um, First of all, we have an excellent department. Uh, concerns about retaining officers and recruiting officers is a problem not just in Arvada, but metro-wide. And so uh, I look forward to your efforts in addressing those issues as time goes on. You know, I constantly, as do others up here, get emails from folks who are starting to stay away from Old Town, Arvada. Um, and we've got to see what we can do to make sure that our citizens feel safe in Old Town. The, um, you know, the, uh, I, I, we're a victim of our success down there to some extent, but, you know, I, and I know you all will come up with some creative solutions to, to address the issue, and I'm not expecting them tonight, but I look forward to that discussion going on. And I want to finish with uh, a recognition that both of our deputy chiefs did a great job tonight, uh, and they are the two finalists, as I understand it, for the chief position. Uh, we did a nationwide search. Um, we had other 
people we looked at from around the country, and it comes as no surprise to me that the two best potential candidates are our two deputy chiefs, and I do not envy Mr. Devon's decision that he's going to have to make on this. This is not a city council decision, but uh, the, the beauty of it from my perspective of you can't go wrong with either one of them because they're, they both have demonstrated, I think, in their years of service to this community, excellent uh, leadership, and, and uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how it, how it plays out, but uh, I commend both of you for, and congratulate both of you for, for being finalists for the position, and, and I know that there'll be a process that maybe Mr. Devin can explain a little bit in terms of community involvement in, the, in, in discussions and things of that nature, so I'll give it to you, Mr. Devin. Yes, thank you. There's actually going to be two ways the community is being involved. Uh, one is there's a community panel uh, that will be interviewing our two finalists uh, on, I believe, Wednesday, June 27th. And then later that evening, uh, during the hours of 4 to 6 p.m., uh, we will be having a reception for the uh, community in our city hall atrium, uh, again, 4 to 6 p.m. on Wednesday, June 27th. Very good. Mr. Devin, anything else for us tonight? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Thank you. We are adjourned.